Today's video is brought to you by Athletic Greens. I'm going to tell you more about them in just a bit. Get ready for the thrilling story of The Roof Man, the notorious criminal who pulled off daring rooftop robberies of fast food chains and businesses across nine states. After being caught and sentenced to prison, The Roof Man escaped and assumed a new identity, leaving a double life in the local church community. He committed armed robberies, burned down a dentist's office before being arrested yet again. With a perpetually monotonous life and the possibility of escaping again, The Roof Man's true identity remains something of a mystery, leading some to speculate that the original culprit is actually still at large. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome. The format of this show is, uh, well, today we're covering The Roofman, as you just heard in the introduction. The format of the show, I have no idea what this is about. Danny has written me a script. I'm going to read it, and Jen, a wonderful editor, is going to edit this. Let's just jump in, shall we? He was a member of the local church, he had a steady relationship, and he was known for his generosity in handing out expensive new toys to children. But by night, John Zorn was the fugitive criminal mastermind known as Roofman. The trouble with Roofman is that it's difficult to fully pin down his contradictory character. The serial arm robber who once lived in a toy store was part Santa Claus, part Robin Hood, part Peter Pan, part Megamind, and part Easter Bunny. And although he made a brief appearance on America's Most Wanted, the gentleman bandit appears to attract a surprising level of respect from the police, as well as his corporate targets, and even the innocent customers caught up in his meticulously planned and raids. It's not often the police say nice things about wanted criminals who've just escaped from prison, and it's not that often that we get to say nice things about villainous subjects that the casual criminalist nope, it is a bloody nice break. Because I'll tell you what, I've re- this is the second episode of Casual Criminalist I've recorded today. You know what the first one I recorded today? Jared Fogel from Subway. As in the, 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 the guy who did horrible things and then ended up in prison. Um, that guy. That guy. So this is very nice for me. Because cause Jared's but this guy was a bona fide genius with an affable and considerate character. He might even be considered by some to be a bit of a legend. We're allowed to say that because he never set a hedgehog on fire or bludgeoned anyone to death with a sledgehammer. In fact, on the whole, he was surprisingly chivalrous and non-violent for an armed robber. But the gun-wielding roofman was still certainly a very different guy to the church-going John Zorn. Although John Zorn had settled down in North Carolina by the year 2000, the story of Roofman begins a couple of years earlier, and a couple of thousand miles east in Sacramento County, California. By 1998, trying to order a Big Mac from McDonald's anywhere in this region was proving to be a bit of a health risk. <laughs> Isn't ordering a Big Mac a health risk anyway? <laughs> Couldn't resist it. You're pretty funny, dude. Are you looking for a delicious way to support your wellness routine? Well, look no further than Athletic Greens and AG1. With just one scoop a day, what you do is you take it out of this thing, you use the scoop, you put it into there with some water and you shake it up, and they are combining nine essential health products into one simple and convenient serving. Say goodbye to multiple pills and products and hello to comprehensive daily nutrients and gut health support. They've got a whole list of them on the back there. It's so many. Look, what I do in the morning, I put it in here, I shake it up, I have it along with my coffee when I get to work, and uh, it's just a good time. I feel like it gives me that little bit of sustained energy boost from the coffee, so it's not just, you know, it's not just caffeine. It's all of the stuff that's actually good for me, it makes up all of those holes in my diet that I absolutely know I have. It tastes great. It's kind of, they, they told me in the talking points, it's got a pineapple flavor, and I've been trying to put my finger on the flavor of Athletic Greens forever. It's kind of just like sweet and good and like, it looks very green, but it tastes it tastes good. And it's uh, apparently pineapple and vanilla. And I'm like, I taste the pineapple, I'm not sure. Yeah, there could be some vanilla in there, I suppose. It's sweet, it tastes good, that's what you need to know. So look, why not give AG1 a try today? If you order through my link below, what you're gonna do is you order the AG1, you get the shaker and all of that good stuff, but you'll also get five packets of uh, their travel packs. So these are good when you're traveling out on the road, whatever, five of those. And uh, also a year's supply of vitamin D, which is fantastic, isn't it? So grab yourself the canister and the shaker and make AG1 a part of your daily routine. Just one scoop, one minute, once a day, and it's that easy to support your whole body health with AG1. Refrigerate after opening for best results. Oh yeah, keep this stuff in the fridge once you've opened it. Uh, Try AG1 now and feel the difference it makes in your daily life. There's a link below. And now back to today's video. But not because of the amount of calories in a double patty Big Mac yet. (laughs) Daddy got the same joke there. Not a surprise really is. 
it's it's uh, it's pretty obvious but because there was always a lingering threat that roofman might just be waiting in the wings while you were trying to enjoy an egg mcmuffin and whenever roofman showed up you knew you were in for something of an extended visit to mcdonald's unlike most armed criminals roofman didn't just randomly barge through the door waving around a weapon as you might be able to guess from the name, Ruthman decided to descend from above like Ronald McDonald's manic evil twin. He usually struck as the restaurant was opening in the morning or preparing to close in the evening, so the risk-averse customer would be better off ordering their Happy Meals at around lunchtime. Well, this was in the night, late 90s, so there's definitely still more cash around, right? Why would you strike in the morning? It's like, I don't know, I worked at a shop. In the morning, there's just a float in the till. It's like a few quid, maybe a couple hundred quid. At the end of the day, it's stacked fat with cash. Always do your robberies at the end of the shift. Roofman would have already prepared long in advance for his surprise visit by discreetly hacking or sawing or drilling a hole through the roof of the restaurant. He would then clamber down into the interior via the use of ropes before covering all of his tracks and nipping to the restroom where it hide until what he considered to be the precise perfect moment to pounce. Then, wearing a mask or bandana to presumably disguise, disguise his true mild-mannered identity, Roofman would make his presence known by pointing a semi-automatic handgun at the employees and customers, ordering them all to get inside the wall in freezer or back room and then cleaning out the cash registers before quickly making his exit through a back door over the course of around two years the roofman struck at least 60 times taking around a couple of thousand dollars on each visit a couple of thousand dollars does seem like very little money for armed robbery which is years and years in prison it seems like the risk to reward weight ratio is just too low why not rob like i don't know a store with a bit more money like I don't know, a store that sells TVs. Or a bank. Oh, banks have more security. Go just just rob a store that has more cash turning over. How much cash does McDonald's really have? It can't be that. I guess people do spend a lot of money at McDonald's. Like, it's very busy. I don't know. Maybe this is why he did it. Maybe this is the, the most cash-heavy business. During that time, he gradually expanded his operations across nine states, including Nevada, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and Massachusetts, as repeatedly robbing the exact same branches of McDonald's in Sacramento County every week might just have made his movement slightly predictable. And although his sights were set on McDonald's's for, the most, for most of his misdeeds, he did very occasionally branch out into other rooftop robberies of businesses such as Burger King, Blockbuster, Toys R Us, and Home Base. But whilst the whole concept of armed robbery might be frowned upon in some quarters, it has to be said that Roofman was very polite and considerate to his victims. He wasn't the type to scream at everyone to get down on the floor if they didn't want to get hurt. Admittedly, he did have to assert his authority on some level, otherwise the employees would probably just snap at him to get back in the queue and stop mucking about. Ruthman usually indicated that he meant business by firing off a few shots into a wall, but once he felt confident that it got everyone's attention, he was surprisingly cordial, displaying impeccable manners and genuine consideration for his victims. Before politely asking everyone to get in the walk-in freezer, he always made sure that they had opportunity to grab their coats and sweaters first so they wouldn't feel nippy or catch a pesky cold. He even said, please and thank you. I mean, good manners cost nothing, do they? <laughs> Ruthman, like I dead's vibe, he's British! <laughs> Ruthman also joked around with everyone to try and lighten the mood, pointing out to the employees that at least they'd probably get the rest of the day off. The victims wouldn't be left inside the walk-in freezer for very long. Anyway, upon leaving the scene of the crime, the first thing Ruthman would do when he felt it got clear was call the police and inform them that a bunch of people needed to be let out of the cooler. You never saw that level of consideration with Bonnie and Clyde. Ruthman's copybook wasn't entirely bot free though. During one holdup of a branch of McDonald's in Sacramento, he resorted to pistol whipping one of the employees. I had no idea what pistol whipping meant for the longest period i literally found out maybe a year ago that it needs to smack someone in the face with a gun <laughs> so that's it i don't know i don't know what i didn't i don't know what i imagined like some sort of whip attached to the end of a gun that you'd whoosh someone with but no it just means to smack someone in the face with a gun who knew everybody except for me apparently this might sound a bit brutal and out of character, but it was in direct response to a surprise attack from the employee who had managed to sneak up behind him and strike him over the head with a bucket. This was obviously not something Roofman could just laugh off, and his attempt to reassert his authority didn't leave the employee with any serious injuries. But, odd violent retaliations aside, what are you doing, employee? <laughs> if you're getting armed robbed, it's not your money. Just chill out. Just be like, yeah, sure, take it. <laughs> take it, take it and leave. He's there for the money. He's not there to murder. Murder would escalate the crime into something a lot more serious. If he doesn't, he doesn't have to kill anyone. He doesn't want to kill anyone. He just wants the money. Just let them take the money and leave. And I've told this story before when I worked in that shop and they were like, if someone tries to rob the place, let them rob the place. Do not press the alarm. Just do exactly what they want. <laughs> Don't be a hero, Dave. <laughs> and it's always my response was like, yeah, I mean, obviously. 
But odd violent retaliations aside, Roofman's generally cordial behavior and cunning tactics appeared to inspire a weird level of respect from his victims and the police. Mike Van Winkle, spokesman for the California Department of Justice, told the press he's businesslike and focused and very serious about what he does, but many of those he's robbed have been struck by what a nice, decent guy he seems to be. A real gentleman. McDonald's even adopted a bizarre, comical response to the long chain of armed robberies, noting that we may have a real hamburglar on our hands. He likes us. He's very brand loyal, and we work hard to build that loyalty. <laughs> Are they turning this into a marketing opportunity? For a couple of grand, it's honestly probably worth it. I'm not sure that all the McDonald's customers and employees who got shoved into a walk-in freezer would have entirely appreciated the humor, and McDonald's later took the matter a little more seriously when they stumped up a reward of $10,000 for information leading to his arrest. They probably only felt this change of heart when they discovered to their dismay that Roofman had been robbing branches of Burger King on the side. That two-timing scoundrel. But it's the reaction from the police that raises the biggest eyebrow. Instead of adopting the usual official stance of, we're gonna nail this son of a they seem to prefer to point out how Roofman was pretty impressive at his job. Yeah, also police pointing out how good a criminal is. It's just like, wait, so just, he's only good because you can't catch him. <laughs> He's like, no, he's a master criminal. Criminal masterminds <laughs> robbing McDonald's. And it's true that the Roofman had been quite ingenious in turning his criminal operations into a fine art. Even though he was robbing different business locations around nine states, he was effectively replicating the exact same crime each time. He targeted fast food restaurants as he knew there were far less security to navigate than, say, a bank, yes. And leaving aside that one brave employee with the bucket, he knew that most weary fast food employees on minimum wage weren't going to do anything reckless in a bid to stop a robbery. The preparation and execution of each rooftop descent was immaculately orchestrated, but perhaps the most ingenious part of the whole master plan is how Roofman had cleverly tapped into the cracks of corporate procedure. He was exploiting the almost immutable patterns of corporate routine. All these employees were following the same preset sequence and performing the same chores in the same areas of the building on the same day. They were almost mindlessly following an entirely predictable cycle of monotonous events, doomed to repeat the same actions over and over again, almost as if they were trapped in a time loop. And it was Roofman's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like life sometimes, isn't it? And it was Roofman's job to study these patterns and exploit the weaker segments of the daily cycle. I don't think McDonald's is built on this. There's that, is it a book? There's something, there's, it was either a book or a documentary I saw about McDonald's' systems and how they work and all of this stuff. And McDonald's has made so much money off this boring, exact repetition of everything and keeping everything as a perfect system that it's like yeah we get robbed occasionally <laughs> it's like that it's made us billions of dollars it's a good trade-off of course i'm not having a go at mcdonald's employees here i'm sure that millions of us throughout history have experienced periods in our lives where it feels like we're powerless zombies on a conveyor belt to infinity oh danny that is dark perhaps even roofman had become so caught up in his expert criminal manipulation of human uniformity that he himself had unwittingly found himself mindlessly following an entirely predictable cycle of monotonous events doomed to repeat the same actions over and over almost as if he was trapped in a perpetual time loop and i did have to consider there whether i'd accidentally read that paragraph twice but no it's a clever joke from old Danny there. Genius billionaire playboy philanthropist. Uh, having said that, even genius criminal masterminds have their off days, and not every single operation was a slick success. Police occasionally found abandoned equipment and only half-completed holes on the roofs of fast food restaurants, suggesting that Roofman had been forced into making a hasty exit before he could finish the job. In that case, that's not an example of him failing. That's an example of him succeeding, because he knows when to give up. That's 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 a good thing. Like not being like, no, I'm I'm not that committed to this. This one's too risky. Let's go rob another McDonald's because there's thousands of them. On another occasion, he drilled down into the roof of a McDonald's in Folsom in Sacramento County, only to find that the restaurant was closed for Thanksgiving Day. Oh, wait, you wouldn't check that on. Oh, it's back in the day. You wouldn't check that on the door. <laughs> By and large, aside from forgetting to make a note of national holidays in his diary, yeah, but wait, is everything closed on Thanksgiving Day? Isn't this America? I thought you had 24 hour everything. Things close? Even the KFC, the KFC near my house is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And I'm very comforted by the fact that I can walk about four minutes and have a KFC at, you know, 4.15 a.m. in the morning. I never do, but it's very comforting to know that I can. You're a very lucky man. Roofman was close to flawless execution in his increasingly prolific rooftop robberies. And it was perhaps this step up in the number of rooftop robberies that eventually led to his downfall. The police had already come astonishingly close to catching the roof man in the act during one attempted robbery of a branch of McDonald's in 
Placerville in El Dorado County, the police were alerted whilst he was still on the roof. After he made a desperate scramble down to the ground, it appeared that the police had the guy cornered in the parking lot, but with a single bound, the roofman was free. He made a pretty impressive leap over a massive chain-link fence, sprinted across four lanes of busy traffic on Interstate 80, and disappeared into the woods. Wow. In the movies, and on like, you know, those shows, the, the, the ones where they have the cars and they're in the police chase, they always get caught. <laughs> People can escape from the police. The Placerville police will always remember that that is the day they almost caught the Roofman. But the North Carolina police did eventually get to grips with Roofman on the 20th of May 2000. Roofman had already done the early morning shift at a branch of McDonald's in Gastonia, North Carolina. Whether he was fueled by greed or an admirable desire to increase productivity, he decided to tackle a closing shift on the very same day. <laughs> <laughs> Danny says not in the same branch, obviously, and I'm like, he robbed the same place? What, twice in one day? No, he traveled for a full 10 miles to another branch of McDonald's in Belmont, this time armed with a 22 caliber rifle. But on this occasion, he was surprised again by the bravery of a McDonald's employee who wasn't going to give up the profits to his corporate employer without a fight. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they don't care, dude. Don't fight. They're much more concerned about the lawsuit. The bravery didn't extend to lobbing a bucket at Roofman's head. Instead, the employee just managed to discreetly hit a silent alarm button while Roofman's attention was probably focused on making sure that everyone was wrapping up nice and warm for another stint in the freezer. Isn't that silent alarm going to be like a constant concern? How do you know people aren't pressing that silent alarm? There was the silent alarm in the shop where I worked. Was it a silent? I think it was just a loud alarm. No, it must have been a silent alarm. Otherwise, you're just asking for trouble. But there were these two things you'd press underneath the till at once, like two buttons at once. And they were like, don't press them, even if you're getting robbed. But I, if, if you're a robber, aren't you always worried that someone's just quietly done that and then you wouldn't know? I'd always just assume, if I was robbing, that that button has been hit as soon as someone lays eyes on me and I have whatever the police response time to that area is, which I would know by, you know, I don't know how you know that, but you could figure it out somehow, right? Use your big brains, criminals. Just assume you have that amount of time. For a while, it looked as if Roofman had made yet another rapid, successful exit from the crime scene with a cash haul juicier than a Chicken McNuggets share box. But having been unaware that the alarm had been raised, he was equally unaware that the police were already on the hunt as he prepared to, prepared to make his next move. He was spotted attempting to reach his vehicle in the nearby church parking lot and was chased again into the woods. But this time, the Roofman was caught. Yeah, if they know his car, if they find him going up to a car, they're going to search the out of that car. They're going to get DNA. They're going to find out. I don't know. I feel like if you're robbing somewhere and you use a car, that's got to be a stolen car, right? You can't just be using your car. Although, who steals? Stealing a car is a whole other crime. So maybe it was just further away and he was like, no, you can't use your own car. What are you doing? <laughs> And here's another example of Roofman's quite remarkable good manners. After he was caught and handcuffed, he didn't start squirming about while screaming, I've been stitched up like a kipper by the filth. Instead, he calmly turned to the arresting officer and noted, you guys did a good job today. I'd love to think that the arresting officer proudly responded with, gee, thanks, Roofman, but he probably didn't. However, there remains a question mark here, which has never been definitively resolved. Had the North Carolina police really caught the Roofman? Or had they just caught a Roofman? The arrested individual was the man who would later go on to assume the fake identity of the mild-mannered John Zorn, the Bible basher who was a respected member of the community in Charlotte, North Carolina. But for now, we just knew his real name, Jeffrey Allen Manchester. Not an awful lot is known about Jeffrey's life leading up to the arrest. Unconfirmed reports suggest that he had an ex-wife and three children living in the local area, although the only family member who ever agreed to speak to the press was his mother. We do know that he once spent time during his younger years actually working at a branch of McDonald's. Later on in life, we know he served as a U.S. Army reservist with another unconfirmed report suggesting that he was downgraded to a reservist after getting stripped of his combat status for reasons that military officials would never reveal. This might explain why he became disillusioned and embittered over his military career and decided to step back into McDonald's, albeit not through the front door. Here's the thing, though. The police had concrete evidence that Jeffrey had pulled off the two McDonald's robberies on that day in May 2000, and during interrogation he was happy to confess to these two crimes, but Jeffrey claims that he hadn't committed any of the other 60 crimes that had taken place over the previous years. Yeah, why would you? <laughs> They're like, we caught you, Ruth, but he's like, you caught me for the crimes that you caught me. No other crimes. I've committed no other crimes. Why would be, <laughs> you'd be insane to be like, yeah, you caught me, it's been years, 60 robberies. <gasps> You just have that moment of, oh, God, no, they only knew about these two. They, I mean, they can only prove these two. And that's why you always get a lawyer. One day you're putting them away. Next day you're setting them free.
Lawyer, 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 lawyer. Instead, he reckoned that he had been inspired by the stories in the press relating to Roofman and had decided to carry out copycat robberies in honor of his hero. The police weren't remotely convinced. All the crimes had been carried out in an almost identical manner. Although Roofman wore a mask, witnesses often painted a very similar picture of a man with a strong athletic build and a pronounced Adam's apple attributes, which matched those of Jeffrey Manchester. But that is not close to proof. And it's worth pointing out that following Jeffrey's prison sentence, the regular rooftop robberies mysteriously dried up. Again, not enough to count as proof. And yet it appears that the police couldn't ever pin any of the previous robberies on Jeffrey Manchester, and nobody was ever charged with them. The police could only charge Jeffrey with armed robbery and kidnapping for those two McDonald's heists that unfolded on the same day. But he certainly got clobbered with a pretty hefty punishment for those two robberies in late 2000. Jeffrey Manchester was sentenced to 45 years in prison. What? What? I, I'm only outraged at this because this morning I recorded an episode about bloody Jared Fogel, the subway dude who ended up being a... I haven't used it. There's a word that you can't use on YouTube because it will get you demonetized, apparently. Look, it's a P word. And he went to... well. There was him, he got like 15 years or something. And then one of his mates, who was even worse, got like 30 years. All that this dude just did armed robbery twice. I mean, yes, armed robbery is bad. It it but what the the extent of the crimes in that previous episode disgusted me. This is like, okay, he armed robbery didn't <laughs> Oh, I don't understand American prison sentences. <laughs> What's going on? No, they won't. We're nuts. You'd have thought they'd at least shaved off a few years for his good manners. I mean, I guess one thing is they're like, well, we kind of know you did the other 60 crimes, so we're just going to absolutely hammer you for the two that you did do, like maximum sentence style of stuff. But isn't that a bit unfair? <laughs> he is so polite and courteous and thoughtful. There was, however, one minor problem. There wasn't a prison in the land secure enough to hold Roofman. After being moved around various different prisons in North Carolina, Jeffrey eventually settled down in Brown Creek Correctional Institution in Polkton, a prison from which nobody had ever escaped since it had opened for business seven years earlier. For the first five years of his sentence, Jeffrey appeared to behave like a model prisoner and picked up a nice little job in the metal plant. <laughs> Be like, don't give that guy a job in the metal plant. He's going to do something with that metal. But he had more than likely been plotting his escape since day one. He was patient enough to play the long game. Under the guise of being a model prisoner, Jeffrey had quietly fallen back on his old expertise of studying patterns in routine and human behavior to exploit the vulnerable cracks in the system. Yeah, dude. If you were in prison forever, right, and all you had to do was like, and all, there's nothing to do. You'd just be like, that's interesting. Look at that pattern. And you had years and years just to think about escaping. That's a lot of brain power going into one singular task. If McDonald's employees think that their working days can feel a bit repetitive, they should try spending a few years in prison in which both prisoners and officers alike are almost mindlessly following an entirely predictable cycle of monotonous events doomed to repeat the same actions over and over again, almost as if they were trapped in a perpetual time loop. Um, nice. Uh, also, I feel, you know how I mentioned McDonald's won't mess up that system, even if they do occasionally get robbed because it's so profitable for them. Prisons need to interrupt their things because the consequences are higher. <laughs> Jeffrey observed the routines of the prisoners and the guards and the changing of shifts, but more importantly, he observed the routines of the delivery trucks. And while he was compiling his mental notes on the deliveries and procedures of the delivery trucks, he got busy in the metal plants putting together a plywood platform, which he spray painted black. At some point, he managed to attach this black plywood platform to the undercarriage of a delivery truck without anybody noticing. But he still had to wait for the perfect moment to put the final phase of his plan into action. On June the 15th, 2004, dark clouds gathered over Brown Creek Correctional Institution and provided Jeffrey with the opportunity that he had been anticipating. After finishing up work at the metal plant, he seized the calculated moment to slip out of line undetected and made his way to the livery truck, oh, which was just getting ready to leave the building. Jeffrey slid under the truck, attached a small piece of black cardboard to the back end of the chassis for a little extra privacy, and then he clung tightly to the pre-prepared black plywood. He had kind of created a primitive optical illusion here, which was helped by the miserable weather conditions. Anybody taking a quick check underneath the truck would have just stared into a fuzzy black void and given it no further consideration. After spending two years of his life making dramatic surprise entrances from above, Roofman had now made a dramatic exit from below as the delivery truck trundled away from Brown Creek Correctional Institution. <laughs> I do love a good prison break story. Especially when it's a guy who's like this, he's a bit harmless. <laughs> 
Maybe this guy was going to need a new nickname. But Jeffrey had other things to worry about for now. For starters, the delivery truck didn't actually go very far until it parked up a nearby at a nearby administrative building, potentially leaving Roofman with a long journey ahead on the road to freedom. A little later on that year, a new face popped up in a neighborhood in Charlotte, North Carolina. His name was John Zorn, and this quietly charming and generous guy quickly turned into quite a likable and popular figure. He joined the Crossroads Presbyterian Church and attended Bible class every Wednesday. He dressed up as both Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny for Sunday school Christmas party, handing out expensive new toys to the poor, unfortunate children who have to spend the half their weekend putting up with dreary Sunday school sh- yeah, I once went to church with my grandparents, more than once. Like they were quite into the old churchy thing, and I don't know, it's just boring. I don't want to do it, <laughs> so I don't. During a singles lunch held by the church, the largely unassuming John Zorn hooked up with a new partner, a mother of three by the name of Lee Wainscott. Within the space of just a few months, John was showering Lucky Lee with diamond earrings, giving her the hottest toys in town to the three kids and taking the whole family on holidays. Yet, there were just one or two strange things about John. Nobody was ever allowed to visit his pad, and he never talked about his job or where exactly he was getting the money to pay for all of these lavish gifts. I feel like in that situation, don't you like, shouldn't you craft like a cover story before? It's like, oh yeah, no, I had a rich like uncle who died and he left me an estate and there's the, 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 there's something with cows being farmed something like that just be like yeah that's how and then no one will question it but if you just don't say people are going to be like what's up <laughs> where's all the money cover is that oh you know this and that <laughs> that just makes you sound like a criminal but these oddities were connected apparently john was not allowed to talk about his top secret job working for the government and his living quarters were in a highly restricted government building so movie night was always going to be hosted round lee's place not a problem wait didn't we say that no one knew where this stuff come from, came from? No knew exactly this money was coming to pay for all these lavish gifts, and then we say exactly at a top secret job. Although it must be a very well paid job. I don't think there's really any government jobs that are really well paid, are there? <laughs> No, scrap that, there were lots of problems, because John Zorn was of course the new mild mannered alternative identity of Roofman, also known as the wanted fugitive Jeffrey Manchester. And by this point, he certainly wasn't living in a highly restricted government building. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh. Jeffrey had made himself a new home in a bizarre secret hideout in a busy toy store, plotting his next dastardly move. As he had been fiercely clinging to the undercarriage of that delivery truck, Jeffrey had probably been hoping that the driver would take him a little further than just around the corner. But not one to hang about, he waited until the coast was clear and proceeded to hitchhike the next leg of his journey. Isn't he wearing, like, prisoner clothes? Like, the, I don't want to say black and white stripes, but I'm pretty sure it's just bright orange, right? There was speculation that he might attempt to travel back and see his family in Sacramento County, California, but his mother told the press that she wasn't buying into that, explaining that she didn't believe Jeffrey had put his family in such an awkward position. She also claimed that whilst Jeffrey had expressed some remorse and even embarrassment over his rooftop robberies, she had never been given an adequate explanation as to why he had done them. She was certainly right about Jeffrey's travel plans. He had no intention of making it back to Sacramento County. He only made it as far as Charlotte, North Carolina before taking up residence in a local branch of Toys R Us. Quite incredibly, he hid in a tiny cubbyhole behind a bike display every evening and patiently waited until the shop had closed before getting out on the shop floor to stretch his legs a bit and make himself at home. Home. But this was obviously a stopgap measure. Jeffrey harbored more ambitious plans to upgrade to a plusher pad. And he really began living the dream when, from his modest hiding spot behind the bike racks, he managed to burrow his way next door into an abandoned former branch of Circuit City. Now Jeffrey had the best of both worlds. He no longer had to hide motionless for hours while waiting for closing time in a tiny cubbyhole. He could relax in comfort in a fancy new private spot under a stairwell of the empty Circuit City where nobody ever ventured. Then in the evenings, after Toys R Us had closed, he could sneak back into the toy store and largely just piss about all night like the world's biggest overgrown kid. It's kind of amazing. He would keep himself fit by going for a midnight bike ride around the aisles of the store. If he was feeling in a really playful mood, he would take some of the radio-controlled cars up for a little spin on the roof. And another handy benefit was that Toys R Us came with its entirely free all-you-can-eat buffet, albeit mostly in the form of kid snacks and baby food. <laughs> what is he up to? Why is he... Why... Why stay here for so long? He's fine. You'll like him. 
You might be wondering why this branch of Toys R Us didn't have an effective security camera system in place. Anyone who bothered to check the previous night's footage would have surely raised some kind of alarm when they saw a grown man taking radio-controlled cars up to the roof, gorging himself silly on baby food, and bouncing around the aisles on a space hopper. Well, the <laughs> well, <laughs> this is so absurd. Well, the store apparently did have an effective security camera system, but Jeffrey had taken control of it. After sneaking into the manager's office and studying the manual for the security cameras at great length, he probably knew more about how they worked than anybody else in the store and was able to manipulate the system so it failed to record any of his late night antics. What a legend. Oh, this is so much better than the Jared episode. <laughs> uh, I mean, that lo- that sounds bad because it was a really good episode. Like It was really well written. I just mean it's like, it's, oh, it's less, isn't it? It's just less. It's just less everything. It's just light. An hour or two before the sto- store was due to open again the next morning, Jeffrey would retreat through the secret passageway behind the bike rack back to his bizarre new man cave in Circuit City. And he really wanted to go to town with the decoration of his new lodgings under the stairwell. He painted the walls bright colors, put up posters, set up action figures, and mounted a toy basketball hoop. During these daytime hours, he would often while away time watching superhero movies on a DVD player, both of which obviously came courtesy of Toys R Us, although I'm not entirely sure where he sourced the TV set. Spider-Man was obviously a clear influence on Ruthman's career path, and it's no surprise that Spider-Man 2 was a particular favorite that was regularly on the top of his viewing pile. It does all sound a bit like the story of a man who never grew up, or perhaps a man who was making up for a lost childhood. But there was a sensible side to the living arrangements too. Jeffrey had ensured that he installed a stolen smoke detector in his new home under the stairwell, and it was also reported that he'd managed to pipe in water from Toys R Us so that he wasn't just rolling around in his own man filth. Why, Jeffrey? At some point, you got to move out, man. you got to go and, like, I don't know, what do escape criminals do? Get a new face somehow? He's happy here. It's good for him. And there was a far more serious ulterior motive for his choice of location. From his secret lair in Cir- Circuit City, Jeffrey was planning his next big robbery at Toys R Us. The problem with avoiding the busy shop floor in the daytime hours and avoiding any interaction with the workforce is that he was never going to get into the safe this way. At the end of each day, all the takings were securely locked in a safe hidden around the back of the store, but Jeffrey knew that the manager was the only one with the key to get inside. So, Jeffrey's next big master plan was to mount another carefully orchestrated early morning raid on the store or when the manager manager was on the scene and get him to open up the safe and hand over the cash. Yet again, Ruthman got busy on studying the crushingly repetitive routines of a corporate company corporation, but it was easier than usual this time. He set up a stolen baby monitor in his man cave so that he could sit back and observe the daily schedules of, an inten- of his intended targets for the comfort of his den uh, whilst playing with his action figures and happily munching away on baby food. And there was another big difference. Instead of just observing the patterns from an aloof position, this time Ruthman was able to directly influence the course of events. During his late night visits next door, he started mucking about with the staff rotors so that the schedules fitted in better with his plans, behaving like the almost literal gremlin in the works of an innocent toy store. Ruthman wasn't just identifying and exploiting the weakest spots in the system, he was now treating the occasionally confused employees like puppets on strings and making them dance to his tune. It was shortly after the Roof Man began hatching his latest plot that he assumed the identity of John Zorn and began leading the new double life down in the local church community. In typically childlike Roofman style, he had chosen the name John Zorn because it sounded a bit like Max Zorin, the villain from the 1985 Bond film of You to Kill, and Jeffrey thought it sounded cool. <laughs> it does sound cool. I'm guessing it was either that or John Octopussy. So you are the mysterious octopus. Over the course of several months, Roofman was living something approaching to a normal life with his relationship and church activities, yet he still sneaked off back to his man cave in Circuit City after it had enough of being normal for one day. The church pastor, Ron Smith, later remarked, He was very engaging, down-to-earth nice fella. My bullshit meter is pretty good, it's pretty tough to scam me. There's a good side to this guy. That's what I'm struggling with now, the other side. I'm not entirely convinced that it's tough to scam a church pastor who believes in an invisible man in the sky, but the point is that just about everyone in the local church community felt that John Zorn was a thoroughly decent and kind chap. Just because he's a bit of a criminal doesn't mean he can't be decent and kind. These are not mutually exclusive things. Sure, he does a little bit of armed robbery on the side, but that doesn't mean he's, like, doesn't mean he's a d- 
And his new girlfriend, Lee Wainscott, never once suspected that a new bit of trouser might just be a notorious escaped criminal on the run. At least we now know where all of those toys for kids were coming from. I bet they never got to see any of the really cool Spider-Man stuff, though. <laughs> all of this does make you wonder if Reubenman was ever tempted to give up his life of crime and just settle down in Charlotte. He'd managed to get away with being John Zorn for several months. Perhaps he could have set up a new roof tiling business and found himself proper lodgings that extended beyond a stairwell. He already had friends, a new relationship, new respect. He must surely have considered the option of embracing this new grown-up life. But I suppose the problem is that he was very much living a lie. John Zorn didn't exist. Perhaps he could only keep up the pretense for so long before reverting back to Roofman and slinking back to his secret lair every night to work on the next phase of his villainous master plan. Yeah, and at some point he's going to be like, well, he can't live in the stairwell of Circuit City forever. So he's going like, to want to get an apartment or his girlfriend's wanna get, going to want to get married. So they're going to be like, I'm going to need to seize my D, mate. <laughs> he's like, oh, no, I didn't think about that. You can't just choose a new name. You have to like go buy identities from like, the dark web or whatever or like some dude who how do they do it don't they take like people who died as kids and then make new identities from them or something that's how they do it in the movies right so it's just mclovin yeah doesn't matter let's carry on Reefman would of course need to carry a gun for his latest armed robbery. And whilst he may have lived next door to a toy store, I'm sure he was aware that a Buzz Lightyear glow-in-the-dark infinity blaster wasn't going to do the business here. So, for the first time in a while, he carried out another rooftop operation. On November the 28th, 2004, he scaled the dizzy heights of a local pawn shop in the middle of the night, cut a hole through the roof, and dropped down inside for a private nosy at what was on offer tonight. And he walked away with four handguns. During the same week, he took a trip to the local dentist's. He didn't want to rob anything on this occasion. He just popped in to get a bit of work done. This might not seem massively significant now, but it gave everyone something to chew over just a few weeks later. By Boxing Day 2004, Roofman, or Jeffrey Manchester, or John Zorn, was ready to make his big strike. Just a few days after dressing up as Santa Claus to entertain the children at Crossroads Presbyterian Church, Roofman was hiding under his more familiar masked disguise when he burst out of nowhere to surprise the early morning customers at Toys R Us in search of a Boxing Day bargain. I say burst out of nowhere. He did, of course, just casually sneak out of the secret passageway behind the bike display, but nobody in the store had realized that. There seems to be a little confusion over the final chapters of the criminal escapades of Roofman. It's usually wrongly reported that Roofman got caught again during this particular heist. Whilst it's not the most well-documented criminal case in the world, if we dig a little deeper into the truth, we find that he actually got away with this one. Armed with one of the stolen handguns, he ordered everyone to get down on the floor around the back of the store. Wait, I'm just realizing, did he just rob- he robbed a pawn shop, right? Don't they have guns in safes or are they just hanging out? How do you steal guns from a pawn shop by just breaking into the pawn shop? Surely they have to be locked away. Jesus. Armed with one of the stolen handguns, he ordered everyone to get down on the floor around the back of the store. He didn't have many alternatives, as branches of Toys R Us don't usually come with handy walk-in freezers for prisoners. He then politely frog-marched the manager to the safe and asked him to open it up and hand over an unconfirmed amount of money. Some reports estimate that it was in the region of $15,000. And here's the really clever bit. After leaving everyone on the floor, he then nipped around to the fire exit at the back of the store and triggered the alarm. By the time the police arrived on the scene, naturally everyone assumed that the robber had made a swift exit from the building and was now miles away counting up all of his loot oh that's so clever he just sneaked back through the bike thing and is hiding in circuit city isn't he what they failed to realize is that the robber had actually just sneaked back onto the main shop floor and disappeared through the magic secret passageway behind the bike racks as the police were interviewing the traumatized customers and employees roofman was just next door watching the whole investigation unfold on his baby wife <laughs> Yet within the space of just a couple of weeks, Roofman had rather let himself down in more ways than one. That trip to the dentists was now clearly bothering him because he realized that it wasn't a good idea for a local dentist to keep dental records on file which could then link John Zorn to his true identity as a wanted escaped convict. When Roofman made a return visit to the dentist in the middle of the night, it's possible he was simply trying to locate his own dental records. But whatever his original motive, he eventually resorted to a surprisingly drastic action. He burns the dentist's office to the ground. Yeah, because maybe he couldn't find the records or something like that. So just by setting it on fire, he destroys all the records, which is kind of smart, but also a pretty major crime. <laughs> well, that's one way of making sure nobody's ever going to find those records. But you can't help feeling a bit concerned that Roofman was now beginning to seriously venture off the chimney stack. Really? I don't know. That seems pretty logical. That seems very logical, in fact, to me. Like, can't find the records. I know the records are in there. It ties me to my previous life. I'm going to have to burn down the dentist's office. It's just how it is. <laughs> 
Very shortly afterwards, he broke his own rule by robbing the exact same place twice within a remarkably short window, just a matter of days. Perhaps fueled by the triumph and ease of his very recent haul, he decided that he might as well carry out a brisk follow-up operation. But on this second occasion, things didn't go as smoothly as it planned. For starters, he barely got his gun out before a female off-duty sheriff's deputy came wandering into the store. Rufin responded to this unexpected visit by punching her in the face and stealing her gun. Oh my. But in the meantime, he had lost control of the heist. Customers and employees were running around the shop like lemmings and not really doing what they were told. Ruthman eventually decided that he needed to sack this one off as a bad job, and at the first opportunity, he discreetly disappeared back into the passage behind the bike racks. He couldn't trigger the fire alarm this time, as there were too many people milling around in panic. And witnesses later revealed to the police that nobody had seen him leave via the front or back of the building. Uh-oh, for the first time... The police began to suspect that the robber hadn't gone very far at all. Uh-oh! Can you imagine sitting there and your baby must have been like, Oh God, here we go. Here we go. Following an exhaustive examination of the toy store, the secret passageway to the villain's den next door was finally uncovered. There was no sign of the robber himself. It appears that Roofman had decided he was no longer safe in Circuit City. Smart man. But he certainly hadn't left in a hurry and didn't have much time to tidy up. Police found surveillance equipment, the discarded baby food containers, the basketball hoop, and approximately $6,800 worth of stolen toys. I can't quite comprehend what kind of clowns are carrying out the daily stock checks at Toys R Us. Back when I worked at a branch of Global Video, the shit would really hit the fan if it turned out that a single bag of crap popcorn was missing. The employees who'd been on duty that day would have often had to fork out for any missing items out of their own pocket. That's such a policy of like companies where they're like, yeah, 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 if you break it, you have to pay for it. If you like screw something up, you have to pay for it. It's like, wait, isn't the reason that you get to make more money than me because you bear the risk? going wrong isn't that the whole point of like like capitalism for all of its flaws is like yeah okay so the person in charge controlling all the things they take the risk that's why they get more money and then they're like no i don't want to take the risk either (laughs) that's just being a but over at toys r us it appears that thousands of dollars worth of toys could gradually go missing over the space of a few months and it was all just chalked up to rotten bad luck uh yeah, and it's also way more than $6,800. That was just what they found in his little den. Hasn't he been giving all that money and like all those toys to children in the church and the uh, the children of his girlfriend and all this stuff? Jeez. Ruthman's own luck was about to run out. The police were, of course, on the hunt for the missing fugitive Jeffrey Manchester. During a later search of the cell he had so gr- ungraciously vacated, officers discovered that Jeffrey had spent a lot of time drawing up plans for what appeared to be his dream home. This wasn't your usual kind of multi-million dollar mansion with a private swimming pool, helicopter pad, and a Star Trek pinball machine in the adjoining arcade hall. Have I mentioned that I really want a Star Trek pinball machine? (laughs) At some point? Because that's something I do want. Jeffrey seemed far more interested in drawing up plans for elaborate mazes with secret passageways and trapdoors and escape holes and hideouts, almost as if he were drawing up architectural plans for a house which he might be able to escape from himself. It didn't take long for the police to identify a connection between the missing roofman and a familiar style of armed robbery carried out by a man who lived in a small escape hole next door which could be accessed by a secret passage. But it was a simple tin of empty pay which provided the crucial evidence. After sprucing up his man cave in bright colors, a roofman had left the discarded tins of paint just hanging around in another corner of the abandoned circuit city. The fingerprint found on one of the tins matched that of Jeffrey Manchester, and now all they had to do was find him. By early January 2005, the city of Charlotte was heaving with posters and flyers asking for information on the whereabouts of Jeffrey Manchester and warning citizens that a dangerous criminal may be loose in the local area. And of course, these photographs of Jeffrey Manchester were eventually glimpsed by members of the Crossroads Presbyterian Church. He suddenly realized that mild mannered John Zorn might not be all he seemed. Naturally, it was John Zorn's partner, Lee Wainscott, who received the biggest shock of all. After the police were able to confirm that John Zorn and Jeffrey Manchester were one and the same, they paid Lee a visit to break the news. A shock, Lee initially refused to believe it, until she finally saw evidence with her own eyes after the police showed her Jeffrey Manchester's profile on America's Most Wanted, and she found herself looking at the same guy that she'd been dating for months. Lee later told the press, I was numb. I was hysterical. He was very well-spoken, well-dressed, clean, generous. My pastor and my congregation all fell in love with him immediately. On top of that, it was poor Lee's 40th birthday. But that turned out to be quite fortuitous for the police, even if it pissed all over Lee's birthday candles. After finally coming to terms with the fact that she'd fallen in love with a man who didn't exist, Lee agreed to spend her 40th birthday helping to set up a sting operation with the police. She telephoned John Zorn and invited him over to her place before going out for a birthday meal that they'd both planned earlier. 
John Zorn later turned up on the doorstep that evening with a bouquet of flowers and yet more toys for the kids. I suspect that on social visits like this, he just had to keep reminding himself to knock on the front door rather than drill a hole in the roof or dig a secret passage behind the bookcase. <laughs> but however he made his entrance into Lee's house, Roofman was destined to make his exit in the back of a police van. He remained as calm as ever as he was arrested. Lee later claims that he expressed genuine remorse during a telephone call with him a few days later. She said, He was very sad and humbled. It felt terrible that he had to deceive us. I'm disappointed and confused. I don't know whether to smack him or hug him. It's not known if the kids were allowed to keep any of the cool toys. <laughs> oh, can you imagine they take away all the toys? Ah. Oh. And then they charge them for possession of stolen goods. Meanwhile, arresting officer Sergeant Catherine Scheimreif of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department followed in the footsteps of tradition by expressing hints of genuine admiration for the guy that she had just taken into custody. You hate to compliment the guy because he's a dirtbag, but we can learn a lot from him. It won't surprise me if he escapes again. He's that crafty. In early 2005, Jeffrey Manchester was found guilty of a long list of charges, including robbery with a dangerous weapon, breaking and entering, and malicious use of explosives to damage property. Oh yeah, he blew up the dentist office. Oh. Uh, and again, the law came crashing down pretty hard on Reefman. He was sentenced to upwards of 40 years in prison and remains in maximal control facility today, with no hope of parole until the 2030s. In 2005, so early 2030s, let's say, okay, so 30 years in prison, 25 years. Which seems really light. Because wasn't he sentenced to 45 years? He escaped after five. So there were 40 years remaining on that sentence. Don't you get another 10 years tacked on if you escape? Or is that just something I saw in a movie once? So shouldn't he be in prison for like 100 years? <laughs> oh, hey-ho, he probably won't be. You can't tell feeling there's a bit of a shame in a way that one of the most ingenious and largely non-violent criminal brains of recent history currently spends about 23 hours a day locked in a prison cell with nothing to do. Admittedly, that's probably something of a relief for every branch of McDonald's in the area, but imagine what he might have been capable of if he turned his sharp mind, mind to something more productive instead of forcing people at gunpoint to step inside walk-in freezers. I, th I think they should white-collar this guy. Like that TV show where that con man and the FBI agent team up to catch other con men. This guy could just be thinking about robberies. He could, like, help the police with stuff. Let's put his big brain to work. He's not violent. Let's go. It's hard to say for sure if he was genuinely fascinated by the concept of exploiting the patterns of human behavior, or if he was just the boy who never grew up and became convinced that he lived inside the pages of a Spider-Man comic. Maybe his arresting officer was right when she suggested that Roofman might well escape again. The local branch of the McDonald's should perhaps exercise caution with their future promotions, as if there's one thing likely to bring Roofman out of his incarceration, it's a Happy Meal that comes packaged with a new Spider-Man toy. Or maybe it's not entirely out of the question that he was telling the truth when he claimed he wasn't responsible for the original massive crime spree of which nobody was ever convicted, and that the original Roofman is still waiting in the wings, poised to make his next strike. What we do know for sure is that having spent a great deal of time masterfully slipping through the cracks of corporate routine, Jeffrey Manchester now finds himself mindlessly following an entirely predictable cycle of monotonous events, doomed to repeat the same actions over and over again. Almost as if he was trapped in a perpetual time loop. So that's where we're going to end today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoy this show, you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe. If you're listening as a podcast, please leave a review. That would be most kind. And I'll see you next time.